Stanford University. Credit sheet. So if you're taking it for credit, I pulled the names from Axis and find your name on the list, sign your name. If your name's not on the list, you can add your name and sign it as well. Um, so the rules are pretty simple. Try to attend all 10 lectures this quarter. Uh, if you can't make it to all 10, you can miss up to two, you can miss one or two lectures. And you have to go and watch those lectures online. So on the website, which is cs547.stanford.edu, there's instructions on how to access the talks. Um, they're actually available to non-students as well. Uh, there's instructions on the site, which is the Stanford Center for, Pu uh, uh, Stanford Center for Professional Development. Um, so, Watch the talks there, and then send me an email the last week of the quarter. So in finals week, if you missed any lectures, watch them online, and by the honors code, send me an email telling me that you watched those lectures. A um, couple of quick announcements. The Computer Forum is hosting a career fair on January 12th from 11 to 4 outside of Hewitt. And if you're interested in the rapidly evolving topic of crowdsourcing, I'm organizing a research <laughs> seminar directly following this seminar up in 392 Gates. Uh, talk to me after class if you're interested. Um, next week we have Fred Turner from the Department of Communication here at Stanford, and he's going to be giving a talk on how the creative ethos around Burning Man relates to the work going on in Google. And Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Shuman Zai, a research scientist at IBM. And Shuman is a uh, ACM fellow and a member of the Chi Academy and many other things. And he'll be talking about how uh, the, the design and development process for the touch screen keyboard. So with that, I'll turn it over. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so uh, my today's talk uh, is really a two, part, two parts talk. The first part, I'll talk about some general uh, principles and uh, my own thinking about uh, ease and efficiency in user interface design. And then I'll talk about the journey of uh, research design and development of um, touchscreen gest gesture keyboard. Uh, the two parts are related in some way. Uh, and we'll get back to the general principles later on uh, in my talk. So first of all, on ease and efficiency of user interface design. Uh, there are many ways to look at uh, computer, user, computer user interface, uh, but two basic qualities, two very basic qualities, uh, I would argue, for all user interfaces design uh, are ease of use and efficiency of use. Um, these two qualities are not completely aligned with each other. Often they are actually in, at, odd, at odds with, with each other. So ease means really uh, enabling the user to uh, accomplish goals with very little learning, with very little memory. Um, basically, you can walk up and use based on your prior experience uh, in daily life. And that's basically how I define, how I define ease. Efficiency, on the other hand, is about accomplishing goals with minimum amount of effort. Effort can be many kinds, but mostly perceptual motor effort with minimum amount. Of, so you can achieve things with fewer steps, faster, and so on. So that's efficiency. And these two things um, uh, are uh, not always consistent with each other, uh, because fundamentally, they rely on different cognitive bases or principles. Uh, example of, of ease, uh, easy user interface is the graphical user interface, which enabled the PC revolution that changed the face of computing. The basic principle is all about turning things into, turning actions into vi uh, visible icons or vis visible commands on the screen 
So the user does not have to know or remember what commands are available. The rather, you can just look at the computer screen, uh, seek the uh, available choices, and uh, select uh, actions. So uh, in psychology, it's called recognition-based uh, process. Uh, it's look and select, uh, feedback-driven, outside-in. It's a controlled process. Uh, it requires a higher level of attention. Uh, in engineering terms, it's a closed-loop process. Uh, so that's the basic uh, uh, principle to make a user interface easy to use. There are many others, such, such as direct mapping between display and input, uh, taking small incremental steps, hierarchically organized uh, choices, and so on and so forth. But the most important one is recognition-based. In contrast, uh, recall-based uh, behavior tend to be much more efficient. Think about typing, think about your riding bicycles, thinking about, thinking about um, playing sports. All of these actions are actually recall-based, based on prior skills or memory uh, you already acquired. And that's recall-based. That's much more efficient, much more faster. Um, and in fact, an old uh, paradigm of interaction uh, is based on command line interfaces that are largely recall-based. And that's, in fact, they are much more powerful in many cases, much more efficient. But they're not very easy to learn, not very easy to use. There are also other principles uh, to go with uh, efficiency. Uh, one of them is you want to take a larger chunk of action, uh, and the process should be random access uh, rather than hierarchically uh, accessible. So those are two uh, qualities. In product design, when these two things are at odds with, uh, with each other, ease tend to win in the marketplace uh, for many, many reasons. Um, for example, the success of GUI interface, which enabled uh, the PC rev revolution uh, in comparison to command line interfaces, which basically faded away uh, with some uh, remaining in, in professional circles. Um, so uh, when they are at odds with each other, just easy, ease tend to be more uh, important uh, to the consumer market. Uh, the other example is the underuse of uh, shortcuts. So you can go, say, uh, edit, and then go to find to search for uh, keywords. But you can also do control F. And control F, obviously, is more efficient. It's recall based rather than recognition based. Um, but unfortunately, people actually remember very few uh, shortcuts in general. Scott? Where does search fit into this taxonomy? That's a good point. So there's a resurgence of recall based process. And I would argue that's search. And that's somewhere in between. Search, you think about it, you recall something you want to find, and you do a search, and it gives you a list of things that become recognition-based. And then you can do it, iterate it again from there. Um, obviously, um, there is an issue of scale. Recognition-based interface is quite, e quite good for a small amount of uh, actions you need to take. In early days of, say, Mac or PC, there are only a dozen or so commands or applications you deal with. Today, you can easily get hundreds of applications, and it's getting more and more tedious to find them. And search may come to the rescue. That is, you search roughly uh, with error tolerance, uh, it returns a list of things, then you recognize them, and then you recall again. So that really is a very interesting inter a middle ground. Um, so uh, but why, why people prefer easy user interface over efficient user interface when they are at odds, at odds with each other. Uh, there are many reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, few people read instructions or tutorials. There are many HCI research documenting that. Uh, also, there's, a general, there's just a general tendency that we all value today's time more than tomorrow's time. So if I, although I know if I learn a shortcut, uh, in 10 days or five, day, five days, I would recoup the cost I invested in learning it. Um, but five minutes today is just more valuable than five minutes tomorrow. So, and, and that's just a human nature. Uh, there's a in economy, econ economics, of course, there's a discounted um, value of money down the road in the future, but also, there's also a strong discounted value of time. Um, so, a future, so present time is just more, much more valuable. And even more uh, deeply, the famous, uh, um, psychologist and, and uh, uh, 
economics uh, study on prospect theory. That is, when you face two choices, two prospects, people turn to have irrational, you can call it irrational, or you can call it just in some sense even more rational depending on your perspective, but rather, but in general, you turn to take a safe bet and there's various decision biases. Uh, for example, if I uh, give you two prospects, one prospect, you'll win a thousand dollars, you will win a thousand dollar if you get head. If I toss a coin, you get head. You get a thousand dollar. If I you get a tail, you get a zero. So that's one prospect. The other prospect, the other prospect is that I'll give you hundred four hundred fifty dollars for sure. So rationally, you think I should do the first one because I may either get one thousand or zero. The expected value is five hundred dollars, or uh, I'll take four hundred four hundred fifty. So rationally, you should take. The first one, but most people will say, "Well, no, I'll take the short bet of 450." So there's this similar kind of biases in, when it comes to using, using computers. That is, you bias towards uh, uh, short-term and sure gain rather than uh, expected value in the long time, in the long term. Uh, I would argue this choice, this tension of e between ease and use continues today, and we see a new crop of touchscreen devices coming up to the market already widespread uh, in a very, very rapid pace. Um, so taking uh, iPhone, uh, the famous iPhone now, as an example, it's very easy to use, very attractive. Uh, but you have to say, when it comes to lots of things, it's quite tedious. Let's say I want to, say, turn off or turn on my 3G network. Uh, so what do I do? I look at my screen, I will, I'll visually search, I'll try to recognize what might give me the right choice. And I think, if I know it well, I think it might be in settings. So I click on settings, it will go to settings, and now what? I go through a list of search uh, and the recognition, uh, airplane, Wi-Fi, uh, okay, it could be Wi-Fi, but it could be, let's say, general. Let's say I know the right choice, okay, general. Uh, okay, now, uh, where's network? Uh, I look for network. Okay, now I find it. Uh, now I find 3G. So I turn on or off. So quite a number of steps. Uh, even if you know you make the right turn at every, every step, it still takes quite a bit to reach a fairly, fairly basic function. Is there an alternative to this? And I'll say yes. There, there are many alternative solutions, and they haven't been explored as much as they should be, in my view. Uh, one of them is, is use gestures. Uh, in fact, gestures or stroke gestures, I, I don't mean uh, gestures in the general sense, but stroke gestures on screen or surface gestures. Um, they are recall based. Uh, and they actually have a very long history in human computer interaction design and research, uh, dating back to the beginning of HCI research. Uh, the Sketchpad work at MIT in 1963. Uh, Gould and Wolf did a lot of human factors research on gesture design and gesture research in, in the 1980s at, at the IBM T.J. Watson Research Center. There's also a current generation of uh, touch screen devices that use, already use gestures, but they're very limited, very few limited gestures. Uh, so imagine I do arbitrary gestures, let's say a circle that represents 3G. So I draw a circle, 3G pops up, turn on and off. Uh, that will be much, much more efficient. And the question is, how would you know a circle represents 3G rather than something else? So, so that you go back to that dilemma of is it easy or is it efficient that is important to you? Um, okay, so, um, so what's the general principle to make uh, a user interface both easy and efficient to use? So how, how you can reconcile the two? And there's possibly many uh, theories and uh, knowledge out there that we can tab on. One of them, uh, a well-known research on attention, because it all has to do with attention, is by uh, Schiffering and Schneider, um, published in 1970s in Psychological Review. It's a very elaborate theory, but the basic lessons in there is quite simple. That is, if you want to make efficient or recall-based or attention-free process, they call it automatic processes in human cognition, um, Basically, you have to maintain a very consistent mapping. That is, from display uh, to a control from, from, the, uh, from the stimulus to response, 
it's consistent. If that mapping is consistent over time, you will become, you will develop automatic recall-based attention-free process. Uh, in contrast, it's controlled process like closed loop control. So, uh, but that's not what we practice. Uh, in fact, you look at again this example. If I do the easy one, I go click on edit and go to find, or and so on and so forth. But the efficient process is control F. Those are two totally different responses to the same stimulus, to the same desire. So because this gap, uh, we don't naturally migrate from um, an easy process to a more efficient process. Um, that's why we actually, most of us remember very few shortcuts, command, uh, uh, command shortcuts, until someone pointed out to us. Um, so, so, so there's a gap in between. And this was very um, uh, compellingly articulated and observed by uh, Buxton and his, and his uh, colleagues uh, in the, um, I would say, early 90s, and uh, as well as other groups. The embodiment of this observation is the so-called marking manuals. The idea is that you tap on a computer screen, uh, a Pi menu pops up, or roughly a radio menu pops up. Uh, and you can follow the radio menu's direction to select, say, uh, fruit and vegetables. Start from grocery and then go to fruit, veg fruit and vegetables. But once you remember this gesture, you can actually go ahead without looking at the uh, menu. In fact, the menu is dis de delayed as a penalty to force you to remember. So you do, you're better off if you recall, but if you don't really don't know, you wait. Um, and this process is consistent in terms of motor movement. So either novice or expert, either beginning or, 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 or um, proficient, after proficient, uh, a sufficient amount of use, you use the same consistent response to the same stimulus. So therefore, uh, you will migrate to a more efficient process automatically in use. And that's the uh, idea of marking menus. So now that's the first part of my talk. And I'll uh, move to uh, a different, uh, a second part of my talk. And then you'll, as you, you will see, I may return to the general theme of ease and efficiency. Uh, so the second part of my talk is uh, sort of an illustrative tour of a project I've pursued with my students and colleagues for uh, about 10 years. Uh, it's a touchscreen gesture keyboard. Um, it was driven by a vision. Uh, the vision is that, shared with by many colleagues and many people, in fact, you can say it's a cliche today, that is uh, uh, computing is moving beyond the desktop. Uh, you'll have access to computing power and information everywhere, uh, in your pocket, on your palm, on the wall. Uh, it takes all kinds of forms. Uh, but you all you will be able to reach the same functionality or same uh, source of information in the cloud. Uh, in fact, we summarized some of our uh, thinking uh, in a chapter called "Beyond the Desktop: Metaphor in Seven Dimensions." I co-authored with uh, my colleague Tom Moran. So that's the vision drives us to look for new interaction methods when you don't have a desktop keyboard. How do you enter text efficiently uh, and and in an easy fashion? into computers. So that was uh, the driving uh, vision. Uh, it's also an interesting problem intellectually because writing or text entry uh, is uh, a process that um, uh, it's, a, it's a technology that evolves and changes at every turn of major uh, of history uh, in the history of civilization. We start off carving symbols on, on rocks as, uh, as, as civiliz civilization began. Of course, paper and pencil and writing become a major part of history. Then the Industrial Revolution brought us the typewriter. The PC Revolution brought us the uh, uh, computer-based, essentially still a typewriter. And then we move to a new era that is not desktop-based. And now what do you do? You carve, some, carve out some symbols on, on tablets. Um, so the other motivation of this line of work was driven by as in all research, you can driven by a vision, you can also driven by curiosity. And this curiosity was optimal UI. Uh, in user interface design, it's very hard to define optimality because the goodness is always, almost always multidimensional. Um, and it's very hard to uh, find a problem that you can't define optimality. But in this case, we were somewhat simple-minded simple to think, well, if you use a finger or stylus to tap on a keyboard, uh, this is the famous QWERTY design that we all use. 
um, it's actually, this one is actually not very efficient. And we can optimize it uh, based on a simple observation that is uh, uh, a letter pair from one to another takes time to move from one letter to another. And that time, uh, fortunately, we know exactly how much that time is on average by a simple human movement study law called the Fitch Law. So Fitch Law will tell you if you know how far apart the two keys are, if you move a stylus or finger from one to another, that time can be precisely predicted by this equation. OK, then we know not all letter pairs are equal. And some are more frequent than others, which is very easy today. You just mine any corpus. You'll find all letter transition frequencies, every pair of them. And then you take every pair of each law weighted by their transitional probability. Then you get an average time to tap a letter on this given layout. So we finally can quantify something, which is exciting. And then, if we can quantify that, we can think this as an optimization problem. Uh, so think this way. So this keyboard is really a molecule. Each key is an atom. So where does the, the atoms want to stay in a molecule? Want, they want to stay in the minimum energy state. And that's uh, typically defined by Machopoulos random walk, also known as simulated annealing. So you can let these letters bounce in certain temperature. They will try to move around. Uh, and then you turn up and down temperature. Uh, the atoms will pull themselves to, towards each other to give the lowest energy state in totality. And that, that's the important thing. It's the totality. Uh, it's not something you can exhaust easily uh, with reasonable amount of time. So you need this randomized algorithm to uh, optimize this keyboard. So we did lots of optimization work uh, in about year 2000. And the uh, result? We call it atomic uh, because it's the, uh, um, it's the atoms that did the work, not us. Uh, but it also stands for alphabetically tuned and optimized mobile interface keyboard. Um, so, uh, but then what? We did this work and we did some uh, user studies. We were essentially disappointed that that was fun, but it, it didn't make really that much a difference. It is much more efficient. Um, how much more efficient? Uh, you think about time, it's about 30% faster. You think about the amount of distance travels. On QWERTY keyboard, you move about three and a half keys per, per letter. On this layout, on the atomic layout, you move about one half keys. You, so you save about half of the time. If you multiply that number for every user, every letter, you save, say, one centimeter. I did this calculation the other day. And uh, you spend, say, you type 100 words per day, and you multiply by 360 days, and you multiply that by a billion users. And we're talking about an astronomical number, like uh, trillions of, or billions of miles, and so, and so on. So despite of that, the user experience is still not that great. Before I move next, uh, Jeff. Yeah, I was curious, does your model assume that I just have a single finger? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. That's very important. You do assume that. And uh, if you use two fingers, the optimization metric will be very different. In fact, I won't have time to go into the details. The QWERTY keyboard design, there's lots of folklore theories about it. And it's, the real theory is actually, uh, real history is also pretty controversial. But it basically comes down to when Christopher Scholes and his colleagues designed the QWERTY keyboard in 1860s, about 160 years ago, 150 years ago, they were using wooden parts, and that gets jammed easily. So they want to minimize that chance for two type bars to get stuck each other. So they put one key on one side. The next key, likely key, is on the other side you, to minimize the chance to get jammed. As a result, you alternate between the two hands, uh, which in fact is the number one reason for speed typing, So which is actually pretty good. That's why lots of research later on couldn't find something that is much better than QWERTY. Somewhat better, but not much better. Question in the back, and then Stephen. Very good question. Five hours, on average. Not that long. Much shorter than learning keyboard. Uh, we, uh, I'll touch this later on. There are, p there are people who uh, actually learn it just in one weekend and, and write back to, to us uh, saying, I, I'm really enjoying this uh, new layout. And I'll touch on it uh, again. Stephen? Jeff's question, but I have another question yes. now, which is, is changing from QWERTY to a new keyboard like 
changing from the English system to the medical system. One of these, like, it's so culturally embedded that yeah. we're never going to be able to shift to a different I don't know, but I'll, I'll, I'll return to that topic too. So uh, now let me introduce a key concept um, that led uh, my, my pursuit for the rest of the 10 years. Uh, that is, uh, uh, the, the, in some sense, the, the unsuccessful outcome of the atomic layout. That is, if you ask people to do studies, you'll find, that first of all, they still use this chicken head motion, uh, tapping on, on a screen, uh, not very uh, enjoyable experience. And second of all, uh, you find a very interesting you know, memory effect. In hindsight, it's quite obvious. People don't remember things like how computers remember things. Um, let's say you want to type the word THAT. They type THAT, THAT, very well. But then you want to change one letter. And then you ask them to type a letter T, or even uh, A or H. And they will have to find it again. Uh, meaning their memory is fundamentally, human memory is fundamentally chunked and organized not necessarily by components and stitched components together. So there's a memory effect that, that was interesting. The other observation is that, in fact, in, in, at this day of age, when you tap every single letter in a word, it's completely unnecessary because we know there's a large amount of re information redundancy in words. Uh, so you really don't have to specify every single letter precisely. You can still get the right word. Uh, so that's very well known dating back to Shannon's information theory. So the two observations put together led us to uh, a conjecture or hypothesis uh, that what I call the gesture keyboard conjecture or, or shape writer conjecture. Um, and so what is just gesture keyboard? I'll do a live demo. And um, that's the easiest. If you already don't already know, many of you probably already know what it is. But I'll show it. Before I that, I have those questions in the back. Uh, yeah. Do you did, was the optimus, for the for the optimal keyboard with the little hexagons? Did you have to optimize that for each language, or did you just average languages together? That's a great point. It was done for English only. There's a forthcoming paper that uh, I'm in the process of finishing revising with my co with my colleague. It's on that. It's about optimizing for at least five major languages <coughs> spoken by two thirds of the people, and surprisingly you get almost as good as a result as optimizing for one. And it's very surprising. So, but that's a different talk. Um, so um, this is gesture, a gesture keyboard. You can use it old-fashioned way. Uh, say, hello, E, L, L. Oh, that's old-fashioned way. But you can also do H, E, L, 1, L. It's OK. Give me word, hello. Uh, so do it again. Uh, Hello, note that I missed the letter L, but it gave me letter K. Right now, I turn on animation that shows how much I actually missed the ideal trajectory. I say, I am Shuming Chai. Um, you are watching uh, say Shape Writer. <laughs> Action. So and I'll rewrite the word watching again. W A T C H I N G. But because the system I don't know they I probably oh no, not too messed up. I thought it was completely messed up. Um, so and that's the word watching. So now I'm beginning to return to the principle of from ease to efficiency. So note that initially I watch and I recognize, I select letter by letter, essentially. But then, over time, this recall of the total gesture, of the total shape, will begin to drive my, my, my writing process. So, and eventually, I'll just remember a gesture as the representation of that word, which is a much shorter form of writing. In that sense, it's a way of shorthand. But unlike traditional shorthand, you don't have to remember it. Uh, up front. You can gradually remember it in use. So now, uh, getting back to, uh, so I talked about all oh, this, about this atomic, so why, why uh, did uh, Cordy, returning to Stephen's question, it's still a hard decision. What do you do? Do you stay with the familiar, less efficient, or do you go for something more efficient? And this is the atomic, it's, it's much more efficient, let's say, uh, uh, 
uh, Stanford uh, celebrating um, 20 uh, years of HCI. It's not a word. Um, so let's say HCI. Oops, HIC, HCI, HCI. That's not a word, and it's also, this is actually an innovation, first of all. Um, I'll touch on this again. In design, in product design, in research, uh, you want to innovate, but there's also a trade off. Uh, in this case, the sh to do capital letters, you do a shift key or caps lock key. Come to think about it, these are all pretty old thinking. Uh, today, you can do what I call a case key. So I can just tap the case key that would circulate, cycle through the letter through all cases. It can be lowercase, title case, uppercase, or capitalize uh, the second letter, like iPhone rather than the first letter, and so on and so forth. That can go all through all legitimate cases by in a reverse Polish fashion, that is, uh, after the fact. That imposes much less burden up front so that's, I just did that. Again, I can cycle through all these letters. Okay, so that's, that's one, uh, the innovative side, uh, which, I, which I'll touch on again later. Uh, so now the system draw around a, a bounding box, say, well, this is not a word I remember. I, I know, so okay, but okay, now I taught the system. Now you have to learn it. So now it's HCI. So it takes one step learning. Now it's part of its vocabulary. Uh, okay, let's try research, Stanford. Uh, I'm looking forward to it uh, in a few months, two months. OK. I just accepted your invitation yesterday. Um, so uh, you can do what? Uh, from ease to efficiency, it's adaptive, as I've shown. It's also unified command, um, uh, unified command and text. So, oops, doo -doo. so this is a, a, a PowerPoint, and I can do a copy command by starting, instead of from, just go straight to the word copy, I start from a command key, C-O-P-Y. It does, oops, open. Copy, didn't mean open. Control, copy. And then, uh, just show it's really copy. Mm. Paste. So, and for that matter, I can do control uh, undo. So you can imagine uh, any commands you can think of: print or command weather, or command time, or command date, or command signature, uh, a command address, and so on and so forth. It can give you uh, anything you pre-program that key to do. Uh, that key plus a, a, a keyword in the back. Um, a similar gesture has an ambiguous <coughs> word. Right, as it can mean two different words. Right. So there's two parts that but the question is that what is the degree of ambiguity between two words? Um, in general the the uh, the space of of, of 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 a lexicon is quite sparse. Uh, and I, again I'll I'll touch on the next next slides. Um, I'll answer that. Okay. Uh, but I'll just, again, show you the good question. I'll just show you the um, flexibility in general. The longer the word is, the more redundancy you have, the, the more tolerant it actually is. Let's say the word knowledge. I can do K-N-O-W-L-E, knowledge. That did quite precisely. The pink shows uh, the ideal gesture. Now let me miss every single letter in that word. Oops, didn't do it. OK, knowledge. Ah, that's still knowledge. And I can do quite terse, still knowledge. Eventually it will break down, but you show the, how much ambiguity you, it can deal with, how much redundancy can, it has. Uh, let's see. Knowledge is power. Yes? Can you shift the gesture to a different part of the keyboard? I mean, just do the same thing. But it, like, as long as there's not another word, and it's closer in location, to what you draw and share the same degree of shape, proximity. Yes. Um, not only how many chunk I like, 
like how many people can how many words people can remember as a chart like this? Right. You you remember zero, starting from zero to um, to infinity. It's it's a continuous process. And now again, this is all very good questions. Let me uh, um, scalable screen fun uh, designs about but fun. So uh, we try to make it fun. Um, other than the gesture itself is quite playful in, in general, uh, but you can also uh, say do a practice game, uh, which uh, which uh, people like. That uh, pop and uh, you can I can pop this all day long. Um, also, you can do say you you show me uh, how to do it. I will just watch. Uh, and in psychology, psychology research is called observational practice. So I'll just sit there and, and watch, and the system draw a gesture. Uh, not as effective as I actually do the work, uh, but still, it shows the gesture. And what's uh, interesting about this one is that the words pops up at a frequency according to a memory research paradigm uh, called ERI, expanding rehearsal interval. So the words comes back in increasing interval over time. So you practice them more efficiently. But also, this is interactive. So if I miss a word, the system will know, oh, I don't know that word very well. I better give you a, a more chance to practice. If I know the word really well, it will come back much later. Uh, so okay, let me uh, get on to the talk uh, more. I'll touch on that as well. Um, so, uh, so what what was just shown in here is this: is that it's easy on one ease on one side, efficiency on the other side. Remember, easy means recognition based. Essentially, efficiency means recall based. So, as a beginner, I remember zero gestures. I do the word say quick is Q, uh, Q U uh, Q, Q, Q U I C K, and that's the word word. But then I realized you can draw a rough shape from Q to U to I to C to K. It also gave me the word Q. But each time you draw it, it's a chance of rehearsal. You begin to remember some of the shape. Let's begin to drive part of it. It's not never in totality. Um, but the keyboards begin to fade away, uh, metaphorically. It doesn't, the keyboard doesn't really fade. But in your mind, you look less to the keyboard. You more look into your own memory you begin to remember more and more. So it becomes more and more recall based and more and more uh, automatic processes. Um, so, and this is time of use and the number of words you learn. You can learn, say, the first session, first 20, uh, 20 minutes you use it, you remember the T-H-E, T-O, um, T-H-E, T-O, I-N, A-N-D, and so on and so forth. That's already 20% of the writing you do. Um, so there's a, this zip flaw effect. effect. Uh, and then for other words in the tail part of the Zip's law, um, they are made of common parts. So I don't remember the word, say, uh, computing very, 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 uh, very well, but uh, uh, I may remember part of it. Uh, and then parts of it will be recall driven, part of it will be uh, recognition driven. Again, it's a continuous, uh, uh, again, it's a continuous uh, practice. Let's say um, ask not what. Your uh, country, I don't quite remember, but TI, the, the country part, the last part I do remember, uh, can do for you, uh, and so on. So, um, so it's, a, it's a continuous process. It's never ending. Uh, even in regular typing, we, we remember, proficient typists remember about thousands of patterns. Uh, without uh, the evidence showing that. Okay, so this is what I call example of progressive user interfaces. Progress in the sense that you start on the easy part and move to the efficient part, and it's never ending. It's progress in action continuously. Wendy, you mentioned something early about um, this notion of attention. One of the things that strikes me is that you talk about have to look at the keyboard when you don't know anything. So right. clearly you have to look in that case. But there, if you're in the right starting space, you can do this. And this is like when you're touch typing. You don't have to look at the keys as long as your hands are correctly positioned and go to the home keys. So is there a way, and if you think about other types of gesture systems, 
that just allow you to draw a circle or something. You can start anywhere. And, and so, on. so is there a way of saying, I have this virtual keyboard, so you know, I have, you see what I'm saying? Yes, yes, yes. Awesome. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, again, I'll touch on that later uh, a bit more. But uh, so basically, it's all about trade-off. So we started out having that ambition of doing a completely eyes free, completely heads up kind of design. So it's completely rely on the, gest on the gesture shape. But then there's too much ambiguity to it. So we had to take a step back to relay in part on location. Um, but eventually when we go back. So this is how we did it. This core technology, this slice is the more technical part. So how do you do this? There are many ways to do this. Uh, once actually you realize how this paradigm can work, there are many ways to achieve the same effect. Uh, this is one way of doing it. Uh, the, the, the basic core uh, principle is redundancy, information redundancy. You think about the English language has an average word length of 4.7 letters per word. So five letters, all five letter permutations is already about 12 million. And then you have other letter number of word permutations. In fact, the number of um, letter combinations is infinity in, in any language because you can always add another letter. Uh, so, but, but, the, but the people's active writing vocabulary is about 10,000. For all the legitimate words there is in the American national corpus, about 60,000 words, and that, that's all. So you can see this huge, vast space and amount of white space, and that's fundamentally what you take advantage of in uh, this technology. Um, so uh, specifically, one way of doing it is it's calculating the shape distance. So here's the example that how you calculate the shape distance. You have an ideal shape defined by a word, and then you draw a gesture. The gesture you draw gets computed against all those, let's say, 60,000 templates, 60,000 ideal trajectories, and you, you come up with a metric. So that's one channel of information. But we also have other channels of information where, as Wendy pointed out, we also do have to relay on location. When in case two shapes are very similar um, and, and shared by many words, in that case, we'll start beginning to look at location. Location means where you started, where you end, and anywhere in between. They can, have, they can take a different weights. Maybe initially your visual attention is more than ending, especially more than the middle. Then you pay more attention to those in the, in the, sh in the location channel. So these channels, multiple channels, each of them get, um, has thousands of classifiers, or tens of thousands of classifiers. And then you integrate different classifier results by a Bayesian framework, uh, which this part is quite unique. In not in all embodiments, but in some embodiments, uh, some versions of ShapeWriter, it actually, remember I said, the beginner would look, therefore you should pay more attention to location. The really expert users, proficient users, would look less and recall more. In that case, you should pay more attention to shape. So the two channels are weighted automatically by what? By Fitch's law. Because if you do look every single letter, you follow Fitch's law. If you waste the past Fitch's law, then you're not really looking at individual letters. Therefore, the system recognition engine would automatically shift towards more of the shape channel. And here uh, is basically the equation to do that. So, uh, but geometrically, it's every channel has a, a, a guess has a Gaussian distribution uh, of, of, of candidates. And if you want the shape channel to be, uh, to be more powerful, you squeeze the Gaussian distribution, it, it becomes more assertive. Uh, if it's not sure, it's more flat, it's less, less certain. But this got integrated in a Bayesian framework. So that's the basic uh, idea, one way of implementing it. There, may, there might be many other ways to do it. Uh, and there could be even better ways to do it. Uh, I would not be surprised. Um, so, um, I've mostly covered this page. I'm probably slightly uh, slow on, on, on pace. So now, um, that's the basic technology. That's the basic uh, principle. Uh, I'll review a little bit uh, the history of this project, which I thought could be interesting to HCI researchers and students. Um, so I formed this uh, conjecture um, in around the year 2000. Uh, and then uh, a year after that, I went on sabbatical at uh, uh, KTH, Lin Xiaoping, and Paris, hosted by Michelle and Wendy. Uh, this was almost 10 years ago by now. Um, 
So uh, I had a great fun, and I, I'm amazed of my academic colleagues who have access to bright and, and energetic students all the time. Uh, I had a year of uh, access to bright and uh, energetic students, one of the most Prola Christensen. Uh, so uh, we did uh, the first small scale but ambitious experiment. And that experiment, I remember was writing it up when I was in Paris, was um, completely location free. So it doesn't look at location, just look at the shape, but it's a relatively small vocabulary uh, experiment. And that was published in 2003. Uh, so in history, uh, would judge this is the first scientific research paper on gesture keyboard. Um, and then uh, Prola got his uh, actually three degrees under my supervision uh, since then. He eventually achieved, uh, received his PhD in 2007. Uh, actually, shortly, uh, maybe next month or so, he, he will join uh, one of the oldest universities in the world, uh, University of St. Andrews, UK. And hopefully, he will bring uh, HCI research there. So uh, this is was ten, about 10 years ago. We were coming up with the na a name for the project, which is very important for research. <laughs> uh, so I come up with various uh, possibilities. Uh, risk, uh, clash, uh, risk again, and kiss, and so on and so forth. But eventually, we settled on shark, uh, standing for shorthand added rapid keyboarding, uh, which the, the name became problematic in many ways. One of the uh, problems with that my IBM lawyer didn't, really didn't like it. Um, that's number one. Uh, the other one was, uh, this was, another one was a fun one, that uh, about two years ago I received an invitation from the publisher, of, uh, the editor-in-chief of Nova Publishers, Nova Scientific Publishers. And he said, we are publishing a collection of uh, papers on sharks, its behavior, and learning, <laughs> and distribution. And you're invited to contribute a chapter. So I, I did not know I was a marine biologist as well. Um, my, my colleague, Tom Moran, said, well, just, just for fun, write something. So I began to write an abstract. I said, well, sharks are a new species of, uh, of uh, animals that was uh, released to the wild, uh, uh, was incubated near, near, the San, near the San Francisco Bay, and was released to the wild. But we didn't have good tracking technologies. And didn't know how many copies was actually uh, used and so on and so forth. So shark was, was a mistake. Eventually, my manager, John Barton, uh, suggested the word shape writer, which is more descriptive. But, but again, today, I just call them gesture keyboard, because there are many ways to implement them. Um, so then it actually went to, through a maturation period from 2003 to 2005. We scaled it up to uh, 60,000 words. Uh, this was published in WIST uh, and other places. Um, then the press took notice of this technology. Uh, the first one was in 2004 or 2003 by New York Times. Uh, then we released a version from the IBM AlphaWorks. This was the meant by Release to the Wild. And there were about, um, I think, a few thousands of copies that was, was, load, was downloaded. Um, but that was on tablet PC form. Uh, I'll get very good feedback. Uh, one of them, or someone said, I just wanted to drop you a line to say, genius, the biggest step forward in computer interface I've ever seen. Uh, a completely new way of looking at, uh, um, way of looking at uh, how we think of words. Uh, here's a more substantive review by JK on the run. And he said, I'm happy to report what I felt is a revolutionary breakthrough. It's phenomenal. Uh, it's almost faster than touch typing. Uh, this method is so simple and accurate. It amazes me every time I use it. What amazed me was that he wrote this in re review only a few days after the initial release, the world's first gesture keyboard, only a few days later. He wrote that in that software that was released in ShapeWriter. Uh, so that shows uh, some people can learn it really fast. Uh, but then what? So clearly, this was an interesting technology, at least. But how do you go about it? How do you really make a difference in the world? And that's where it gets even more challenging and more interesting. Um, the challenges, the many hurdles, one is that the business world always involves. Um, IBM uh, is one of the very few technology giants that could and have adapted to different business uh, environment and different business uh, uh, climate in different times, uh, starting from mainframe and so on and so forth. But at this time, IBM moved away from uh, the PC business or, or any consumer business uh, products, for that matter, 
especially in the gadgets and uh, uh, application area. So that was a challenge. Uh, the other is, is challenge, challenge technology. That is, uh, can this? We, we did this demo on a tablet, and people say, "Well, we know recognition voice recognition works pretty well on desktop, but never works well on phones because they don't have enough power, don't have enough memory." They were skeptical, so I talked with a lot of uh, companies, a lot of handset makers, and a lot of uh, potential customers at the time uh, and investors. Um, also, timing-wise. Uh, BlackBerry was on the rise. It was very successful. The whole computer industry, uh, the whole mobile phone industry basically concluded that thumb keyboard was the direction to go. Um, so uh, the other interesting thing, again, as a researcher, you're passionate about technology. But techno a technology is not necessarily a product, and the product is not necessarily a business. So those are all interesting challenges. Um, uh, and also, in general, there is a healthy uh, skepticism towards innovation. Again, we researchers are very passionate about innovation, but the most innovations don't succeed and don't necessarily make any uh, meaningful difference. So it, it really has to be innovation that matters. Um, and especially when it comes to something user interface area, it's very hard to innovate because it requires user adoption. Some others have, people have already raised that question, touched on that. And how do you deal with that? It's, uh, it's an interesting challenge. So given all that, in 2004, Seven, IBM enabled a startup company, a spin out, uh, based on a technology a licensing agreement, uh, which through that agreement has served in that company as its chief. And um, now I had a dedicated team that doing research, engineering, design, commercialization, everything it was a wonderful team, uh, mostly based on uh, based in Beijing, China. And this team uh, did many products uh, in, around this technology. Uh, but all of them face this issue of many interesting trade-offs in design. So first of all, there's a timing. You can be too early or too late. Um, also, what platform to focus on is a big challenge. Um, the mobile world went through many uh, platforms. At the time, we were thinking about Windows Mobile. We did Windows Mobile. And there was a Palm, there's Symbian. And then, uh, of course, uh, later on, there's uh, iPhone and Android and so on and so forth. Uh, these different platforms have different market position, different degree of openness, and different, uh, which means you have different degree of ability to integrate with the platform. Um, the other uh, trade-off is you know, marketing versus development. Development is difficult, but marketing is just as difficult, if not more so. And I learned that sales is a real art. There's a long way from a company who's interested in technology, interested in your technology, to actually writing a check. Uh, and there's a market push versus market pull, uh, which you need both. Um, also, design. Uh, when you actually come to actual product development and release, it's a real, real hard call in terms of how innovative, how novel you want it to be. So again, as you can see, by default, all the software release was in Atomic, although we know it was not a good layout. So Atomic is more back and forth, left and right, also, the gestures in there are much more ambiguous because it turned to zigzag in the same fashion versus atomic or different optimized layout would turn to be isotropic, isotropic in the sense of moving in all directions. And as a result, the words are defined in much more diverse fashion, therefore more, more memorable, uh, less ambiguity. Uh, but court is what people know, so we have to settle on that as default. In some releases, you can turn that into uh, turn atomic on as a, as an alternative, uh, but we did one bit of a uh, bit uh, on the risky side of having a, a case key rather than a, a traditional shift key. So you press this, and after the fact, you will cycle through all the word cases, and some people still don't know what it is. So um, challenges uh, and efficiency and aesthetics and all those were interesting uh, trade-offs in design. Um, so when Steve Jobs announced iPhone, uh, during his keynote, I, I saw, well, the, the, the tide is turning the other way, away from uh, thumb keyboard. So we made the decision to, to invest in, in iPhone and make an iPhone release as soon as possible. So in fact, we released ShapeWriter in the first week of iPhone App Store. And, but iPhone doesn't have an API for keyboard or for any tech, uh, input method. So 
we have to invent, uh, well, have to design a writing pad as a workaround. So you use that as a notepad, but you can email your note. Uh, it's soft, somewhat awkward. It's not a system-wide input method, but at least it gets people to be able to use it. Um, so it was one of the first in 2000, July 2008, uh, and it was quickly picked by Time uh, as the top 11 iPhone must-haves. This is, was along with Google Search and so on. Um, and in one year, it had about 2 million downloads. Uh, in one year, uh, peaked at about 30,000 downloads per day. Uh, this is in contrast with the IBM AlphaWorks release, when you don't have a platform, that in one month, uh, it raised to the number one download at IBM. That means 2,000 downloads per month. And this is 30,000 per day. So the iPhone is qu quite revolutionary. And, and now Android market and so on, that is. We researchers now, researchers actually now have access to millions of users um, to deploy technology at, at almost no cost, uh, except now there's too many of them. So hard to get people's eyeball here to know you have something you want them to try out. But this was uh, the right timing. And we got reviews, uh, a lot of reviews, but I was watching it in the first 24 hours. There was 50 reviews written in the Apple App Store with uh, brilliant, stunning, rocks, absolutely stunning, revolutionized typing. And this was the best one. Revolutionized typing is the understatement of the year. Technology should be part of every keyboard on all touch screens. Someone nominated these software developers for a Nobel. I wish there was such a thing. Um, of course, but as a business, there was still a dilemma about what you do about it, how do you monetize it, and so on and so forth. OK, so someone had a question. I thought, OK. Um, so the company actually, OK, I'm sorry. I didn't pay attention to this. The Shape logo incorporated a shape. Yeah. Was that from a graphic designer, or does it represent a word? Uh, it was both. It was, uh, you guessed it right, it was a, it was a dramatized or uh, artistic rendering of the word shape on a atomic layer. But it's not exactly the, the, the it's not exactly the artist uh, tweaked it, yeah. but it, it, that's the basis. Uh, so it's wonderful when you have a team dedicated to something. So this team, uh, about a dozen people in, in total, uh, implemented uh, a common platform code base uh, with an API, uh, which means it can be ported to all platforms very easily. Uh, so we implement that in Windows Mobile, iPhone, Android, uh, Windows, um, Wise, which is a proprietary uh, platform, Memo, and so on and so forth. Uh, also interesting is that we were able to do it in 40 languages. I don't speak 40 languages. Nobody speaks that many. So what do you do? So we have uh, you know, other companies in the, in the space saying, well, you guys don't know what you're doing. You need to hire linguists. And, and we have the expertise. Let's partner, and so on and so forth. But what was interesting is today with compu computation, with the web, with all kinds of tools, you can achieve a lot by being, being smart about it. So you don't really need that many language experts to, to do. Uh, we were able to actually develop 40 languages. And among people and friends and, and colleagues I know, uh, I have a, we have a way to verify the correctness of the, uh, of the dictionary and database. Uh, so that was quite amazing. I sent a version to Jap the Japanese colleagues. And she used this, she's a language, uh, natural language processing professor. And she was very amazed how uh, well it worked for Japanese. Um, I have a different computer today. I cannot demonstrate uh, Chinese, which requires very different thinking. But we were able to do Chinese pinyin as well. So uh, last year, this come to an end when Nuance, the, the market leader in information input, uh, famous for, 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 for its speech technology as well, uh, Dragon, as well as T9, which is on virtually on all phones, uh, uh, decided to acquire this company as well as all the IPs from IBM. So it started at IBM, moved to a startup phase, and then eventually got acquired by Nuance, and, which is determined to put this technology on all uh, touchscreen devices. Um, so looking to the future, um, so I don't think it's, uh, we've done, we, I, I view this as really the first generation. There could be new um, future generations that can do much better. Um, one is that returns to the point that uh, Wendy brought up, that is, I would say the biggest drawback with ShapeWriter or with gesture keyboard in general is that you still have to look. You can never you can rarely do completely uh, ice-free. Versus touch typing, 
the big advantage is that you can focus on your output, you can focus on the screen, not looking at the keyboard at all if you are a touch typist. Um, so that's, uh, that's still a big problem. Uh, it might be a limitation, not a problem, but limitation. Can we get to the stage that you can just remember the gesture and without looking at it, you draw it? I think someday you can, and this goes back to more language processing uh, in the idea along the line of like uh, speech recognition. Speech recognition actually draw, you know, only portions of informa its information through the acoustic signal. A lot of it comes from language processing, from from ungrained models, from from language modeling, from the context. And when you have enough computing power, you can do that for 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 gesture as well. Uh, the other question is that the layout is still unsettled. Question: How do you do a layout for for shape writing for gesture keyboard? What's the best way? Can you accommodate multiple languages at the same time? And that's still an open research issue. Uh, but even if you can find it, the bigger question is that: How do you make people adopt such a thing, a, a new layout? Um, there's also a lot more mathematical understanding that can be gained by more deeper research of of the idea of the mathematical space of gestures. Um, uh, beyond that, uh, this is quite exciting to think about. It's, it's really a new way of writing. Uh, if you look at these beautiful inventions in human history, uh, how they were invented, uh, what were the driving factors, how they evolved over time. It's fair to say they are rarely, rarely designed. They, were, they usually move shaped by history, socioeconomic factors, and, and geopolitical factors, and so on. Rarely designed for efficiency, with the exception of the Hangul script in Korea, which was designed by uh, a king of Korea in the 1400s. Um, so, in summary, um, it's a decade-long, decade-long exploratory, adventurous project, very atypical. Um, so, a research organization, well, industrial research in particular, is often viewed by four, judged by four P's: publications, the bread and butter. Uh, business of uh, academic research. Uh, so we published about 20 papers around or on this topic. Um, we applied and received many patents. Uh, so the second P, third P is press, not just in terms of publicity, but also in terms of how you, your ideas would, would influence the public mind about technology, uh, for which we had about 100 articles, or actually more than 100 articles around the world, including the BBC, the New York Times, the Mercury News, uh, call it the new way of write, a new way of writing, and products is much more difficult. But we enabled a startup company that was able to de deploy all kinds of products around it, and eventually was acquired. Uh, and, and most importantly, I think it's fair to say we created an information input paradigm, which today are actually have multiple suppliers, multiple providers. Uh, Nuance is, of course, the giant in the space, and there's another, a couple other startup companies. One, one of them is called Swipe. So I'm glad now there are other people joining us, joining us to push this paradigm forward. Um, but it's fair to say we pioneered uh, this paradigm. If you look at the scientific publication, if you look at the early press coverage, or even if you look at the press release history, we released it in first 2004. Uh, any close uh, followers or competitors released in 2008 or at, at the earliest, well after we already achieved um, the iPhone release. Um, there's also unexpected impact. This was not designed as an accessibility project, but, but this is a letter I received recently, uh, a few months back, uh, which is very touching. i let you to look at it. Okay. Yes. Um. So you actually have a new, like I said, paradigm that essentially is one-to-one -one in the language, as opposed to several to infinite, which is the basis of finite set of letters that give you the whole language. So it has its pros and cons. But you started with giving the examples of control F. To me, how would you use this system to make it easier, for example, to include all the commands available to Microsoft Word. So I'm, it's not about typing text, because somebody who is touch typist is very good at it. But doing all the different formatting and 
using the commands and changing location and cutting and pasting. And all of that is what breaks the smoothness of working on the keyboard. And that's what I need to move to the mouse or to do the control F and control V and so on. How this system will be applied there? Um, I'm not sure I'm completely following your, your, your question. Um, so I, I have menus. How could I get rid of the menus and then okay. make gestures to uh, right. implement so, the so, so, so shape hardware, first of all, is a text entry method, but it's also a command input method by being, by being systematic. So you can guess a command by its word. So if I do a print, I'll start from command key and draw the letter, draw the word print. In fact, I can only draw first few letters. It will be sufficient because it's a smaller space. And it will give you uh, the effect of, command, uh, of, of print. But it can also, when the system is uncertain, it can give you a list of choices. So in that sense, it's actually a random access fashion to a large number of commands. And you can also guess it because it goes by language. But you also had another point about, about you think about it, you know, how do you do writing? So Egyptians or Chinese uh, were essentially coding uh, word or syllables. Uh, but the, it, it was an ingenious uh, invention of coming up with letters, which, which is only small in number, but it can codify uh, sound by combination. Um, and this, people say, because you're Chinese, you think of this writing method. I wouldn't say so, uh, but, but it is interesting. It's somewhere in between. But, but I would say the beauty of it is that it starts from still from letters. In fact, can you do this in Chinese without pinyin, which is the romanization of Chinese? I would say very hard to do, because the Chinese letters, words, don't parse. You have to parse into elements. So again, you look at individual elements, and that stitch them into a larger chunk. And it's really the chunking, uh, but systematic chunking over time that allows you to move from one end, easy end, to the efficient end. So that uh, is it's definitely interesting. So can, can yeah. you go back to the, the first issue of menu? Can you do a gesture that go up to the menu of, for example, format, make a selection on that menu, get the selection of a submenu, and go that way? And finally, remember the gesture for the that, that is a marking menus. So that, that's how marking menu works. That's how marking menu works. Uh, but, but usually, they deal with very limited commands. So if you just go to traditional linear menu, you won't be able to do it because there's too much ambiguity simply by length. But if you go to a radio menu or, or pi menu, because it remembers the, the direction, it's much less ambiguous. That's why park, mark, pi, uh, marking menus rely on, on, on radio menus. Um, but then, then there's also some, there are lots of research on it. There's also pros and cons to that approach. Um, what's the best approach? I don't know in terms of commands. I, I think it's a spy product, ShapeWriter, to, be allow, to allow you to do commands. But I don't think that's a, that's a final word on that. And I still, I'm still thinking, how do you do actually non-textual interactions with gesture? I, I think still it's an open topic. Uh, I had a, a postdoc who now joined uh, Michelle and Wendy as a faculty member. Caroline Ebert, she worked with me a year on exploring gesture shortcuts uh, as a way of, uh, of invoking commands. Interestingly, we remember gestures much better than remembering uh, keystrokes. Uh, because, because it's spatial, because you have more to work with, uh, uh, psychologists call this depth of, depth of processing or depth of encoding. You think of it in many ways. Let's say I give you a circle to represent the concept of fish, it's completely arbitrary. But lots of people remembered right away. They said, oh, that's a fish pound, and there's fish in it. So they, they make up their own story to remember gestures. So uh, Carlin's work shows this very compellingly. You can remember about three times as many gestures as key sequences in the given same amount of time. Question in the back. Uh, why can't you do Chinese as the sum of the symbols inside the symbol? Like, uh, they are not systematic. They are not systematic. They are not. They, some of them are more regular than others, made of common radicals or parts. Yeah. My name, for example, my surname, is made of two common parts, three common parts, I would say, but the last one is not, it's the exception, it's not uh, semi common parts. You can possibly use every redundancy to, to correct that. 
uh, but still not very, not very nicely, not very nicely. May, maybe there will be a way, but uh, I've thought about this many times, not very nicely. And pinyin is really the way to go. Already is. Uh, it's amazing how many people actually learned pinyin because of cell phones, because of computers. So China went through this uh, huge westernization or modernization phase in the past 100 or 150 years with lots of struggle. Um, and reforming writing system was one of them. But it's a beloved writing system. It's very hard to reform. And lots of people are skeptical you were ever able to, re re ever able to move, to push a, a Roman letter-based system beyond phonetics, beyond a way of s spelling the sound. But today, you know, just because of technology, because of computers, you know, lots of people now know PIN many, many more than I imagined 10 years ago. Uh, there was another question before I finish. When you were giving the example of how to, um, uh, how to enter, for example, the command print, you start with the command key, and then you make the gesture for print. Uh, wouldn't that be a good application for the reverse Polish idea? Because if you make a mistake with a gesture, you're doing the wrong command. If you can first see what you just gestured, and then you hit the special key for it, turn the last word into a command, you don't have that problem. Right. And possibly both. You can either start or end on a command key, possibly. And there's also open design issues. Uh, again, uh, the bigger hurdle is that it's one hurdle to think about the best possible idea. It's another hurdle that whether people will get it. And that's really a challenge to our field. And you want it to be novel, you want it to be efficient, but you also want people to adopt them. Yes. Steve. So people learn a lot of different gestures in yeah. the process of learning how to use this. Yeah. Have you noticed ways that they try to combine the gestures, maybe any sort of semantics that are developing? Um, well, another related question is that, so why do you stop there? Why don't you just gesture a whole sentence? Uh, you can certainly ge gesture ASAP, and it will give you as soon as possible as a sentence, rather than as ASAP, uh, and so on. So you can define anything you want. So once you know the concept, how you define it is completely arbitrary. The system doesn't know any language on one hand, but it knows all languages as long as you tell it. So, so, but, but, but the issue is more of what level of chunking is, is the right one. So I happen to believe word is the right level of chunking. Beyond that, it gets a bit too much. You, you want to give people a break every now and then. And, and, and words, in my view, happens to be the right one. In fact, we have a technology that will chunk longer words into a smaller fragments of longer words. In cases for like German, you have lots of compound words. You're allowed to write parts. In fact, uh, I don't know, for that matter, I don't know if this version actually has it. Uh, I don't know if this version has it, but if it does, would be if I write a word computing, I can write a word can, uh, compute. Compute, and I write a word ing. The system took off the e and put ing as part of word computing. So it snaps them together, concatenation. So, but so that the idea in there gives you more, uh, more of a break, and you you don't have to chunk the whole word, a, a longer word, one day again. So getting back to this issue that you were raising, yeah. this um, sort of thing between having aesthetic commands as opposed to a set of words that are in my head and I know. Output a set of words. Yeah, some people have to check out the classes, so feel free to leave. Right. Uh, um, but when I'm choosing among a set of commands, which could have hundreds, I'm back and forth. So we work on some way which is called optical Yes. Which allows you to yeah. see the options that are available. We have this in fact, the question is we're talking about this. Right. And I happen to be a reviewer of that paper. I didn't know who you were <laughs> at the time, okay? I love it here. So, so it's dynamic. The idea is that as you go in a gesture, as you progress, the system guess what are the possible outcomes given this uh, current input and, 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 and it suggests you to go to different directions. Yes. Uh, let me just, uh, you know, I have to give credit to I have to give credit to Shape Harder Inc., which is a company. My students, the postdocs, particularly Prola Christensen, but also Carolyn, Xiang, uh, and Tua, and my colleagues at IBM, uh, Barton Smith, uh, Tom Moran, Jeff Pierce, uh, and so on and so forth, and IBM, and, and particularly IBM Research as an organization, which really prides itself in, in pursuing innovation that matters to the company and to the world. And I, 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 I feel sorry to say that I'm, um, I'm leaving such a great organization in about a week in pursuit of uh, other uh, career opportunities, but it's really a wonderful, wonderful organization that supported me for a uh, decade and a half.
So, Anna, thank you for your attention. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.